Welcome, everybody. Herb Day Online. We're doing it. We're the, live. The gift of healing. Keep on giving right here from Autism One. Super Don, my producer on the Robert Scott Bell Show. I'm Robert Scott Bell. We got a special guest today. And I, I tell you, I want to condense 24 hours worth of information into 30 to 40 minutes. I don't know if it's possible. You up, you up to it, Dean? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Our guest today, Dean Petkanis. Uh, he is with Candle Life Sciences, and he's got a patent that we're going to talk about related to something I think everybody should be intrigued with. They certainly are here at Autism One in Chicago. A lot of questions being asked about it as uh, the, the, the families here are very concerned, as they should be, about recovering the function, their, their children who have been taken from them due to many, many circumstances, environmental toxicity, uh, vaccine injury, and the like, and they're looking to plants to heal. Thank God they're doing that. And there are substances within plants, some of which we know, some which we're relearning, emerging, re-emerging sciences. And that happens to relate to this issue today. And uh, that's why Dean Picanis is our special guest. Dean, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. So when you are called a patent holder, you know, I'm going to assume somebody out there listening, watching right now doesn't know anything about this, and they give it a number. How do we relate that? What does it mean? What do you have a patent in? How did you get it? And, and that's where we'll start. Okay, the, the patent that we've acquired is through exclusive licensing the National Institute of Health Office of Technology Transfer. So basically, $10 million goes to research, health research that's funded uh, by the taxpayers and the national laboratories like the National Institute of Health and any of the other divisions like National Cancer Institute and so on. So thankfully, the United States has one of the greatest uh, forms of contribution tax dollars to research and development to find new means of uh, treating health care and other problems. And that's where it started, it started an integral research program that wound up getting assigned uh, to the United States government as well as usual and tax dollars are put in for research and development of national laboratories. That being the case, there's a technology transfer factor that's involved in Incorporating a public private partnership where private corporations can step up and uh, either contract or grant receive or crowd a recipient and or license recipient and we became a license recipient with national health on this what they call a 507 patent. And that's cannabinoids and antioxidants and neuroprotectants. Cannabinoids is antioxidants and neuroprotectants, two very powerful and profound uh, 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 things that are necessary, obviously, for the body to survive the assault of an environment that has just gone, uh, how would we say, toxic, for lack of a better way, over the span of uh, a number of generations now in the West, but all over the world being impacted by this. Uh, neurodegenerative diseases are on the rise, of course. Uh, oxidative stress associated with these toxins, much less metabolic waste. So we look at a plant like the industrial hemp plant, of course, a lot of buzz on the news about medical marijuana. I call it curative cannabis, or heavenly hemp, actually. Uh, we, we talk about it in my new book, of course, Unlock the Power to Heal, as well. The use of this plant and use of these cannabinoids is not unknown. As you said, you hold a patent. You, you reference to the government actually knows about some of these uses because it holds patent on some of these uses. Yet, we hear the media parroting sometimes that there is no science to support the use of cannabis for any health purpose whatsoever. I mean, it's a little bit disingenuous, the, co the conflict within the media. Have you, how have you combated that? Well, we, uh, with some uh, odd, strange, and wonderful reason, uh, the media has tried to kind of cover us, and we're happy with that. Uh, other than the you know, odds and news, uh, journalists have kind of stepped up and looked at us as a recipient of the country setting that. Uh, I think it's a bit of a wild time with our own country. Uh, they'd rather be on the side of capitalism and, you know, look at the issues surrounding capitalism as it pertains to the patent, rather than the true science and what the medical purpose is with the science work put forth uh, a body of medicine. So it's a little bit more work for the to have to do that than it is for them to follow around and say, uh, isn't it a good to get the government out of the patent and so on and so forth. So they feed into the of capitalism rather than what's important which is in the body of the body, which is the science of it. Uh, I think the other thing that's important is kind of memorial uh, science uh, has not been able to step up and work in the area of the restrictions of the Controlled Substances Act. 
So the, the problem is now it's, it, it, there's a paucity of information still across a pantheon of looking at the chemical structures in the plant. So let's look at here to Canada, for instance, where there might be 85 cannabinoids, untold number of proteins, and some other plant matter that's taken together to form a body of medicine, even in its real form. Uh, because of the paucity of scientific research across all of these cannabinoids, uh, the need we're looking for the body of information, the body of information, to speak intelligently about it. So I think in some sense it went through the uh, paths, uh, in other senses it became a journey that's supposed to be in, and they're supposed to get into it. In that regard, they're trying to work with it a bit more into you know, like asking us what we're doing with the body of knowledge and the and moving forward in that regard. All right. Hey, guys, at, at, at uh, technical home for this uh, Google Hangout, we're losing some of the words that uh, Dean is saying, and they're so valuable. I don't want to lose any. I just want to make sure that our audience can hear everything that he's saying. If you confirm that for us, that would be great in case we need to revisit any of these subjects uh, or uh, uh, specifics uh, during the Hangout here. Well, I want to kind of come back to the point about the media. Well, let's look at the media process. They're all over the state of Colorado because of the recreational model, uh, again, you know, here we're talking about medicine, and medicine gets so little of the attention that's needed you know, so that we can bring forth what the uh, potential is with the plant and the chemistry of the plant, both hemp and cannabis. And if they'll go to Colorado and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll spend time with cannabis plant, but they're, they're fascinated with the plant, but they're not fascinated with the body of medicine in the plant. So they'll go out and they'll, they'll look at growers, they'll look at laboratories, and they're coming into the group they're not really getting into the, the, the mix of the science. Okay. Uh, the, uh, let's go back to the media for a second here. One of the things we've been promoting on the Robert Scott Bell Show is the fact that we can access this cannabidiol, the CBD from the industrial hemp uh, plant, in all 50 states right now, not requiring any legislative changes or any FDA uh, decrees or even going to the Supreme Court for some kind of ruling. How has the media picked up or not picked up outside of you know my show, of course, and maybe a few others that are in the, into the uh, really natural healing and understand what's going on here? Have you seen any evidence of reporters inquiring about this accessibility outside of, let's say, Colorado, Washington State, or the others that have made medical marijuana possible for some of the people of those states? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I'll touch on it real quick, but I'm really going to skip deeply into it. But, but CNN spends an awful lot of time speaking with our scientists and our team uh, because I think they were intrigued with the 507 patent, but yet for some reason didn't follow through, uh, didn't put it into the, the second Sanjay Gupta special. And, uh, I don't know if there's a conscious avoidance because of the what seems to be a, a cross conflict. Like, how could this private company be involved with a uh, a patent that's held by the government? And I, again, I can't speak to the the, the incontinence of, of the media's perspective on what it means to cover the 507 patent. Uh, there's only one company in, in the United States that's doing any bit of research underlying the, the science of the 507 patent, and you talked about it at the beginning of the show, antioxidants and, and, and neuroprotectants. Uh, I think that that's a powerful statement, and there are so many of the disease indications that fall underneath that umbrella. It's almost like when we study, when we study chronic inflammation, we know that there are uh, plant-based medicaments out there that deal with chronic inflammation, like, like turmeric root, right, and it becomes curcumin. Uh, that's a, a, but the bioavailability of it is such that it's difficult to take curcumin with a high degree of bioavailability in its current form. So that's a plant-based uh, chronic inflammation. Uh, cannabinoids dealing with uh, oxidative stress and uh, neurodegeneration, I think, is patently important and should be covered by the media simply because you know we're we're only here for a short period of time. Uh, and it seems like that what we've done to the environment is we've we've pounded it in such a way that it could actually shorten our uh, our short period of time here as humans. Uh, we're bombarded with radicals on a daily basis. Uh, the exposure that we're getting now 
uh, with regards to ozone depletion is a serious amount of radiation. You talk about oxidative stress, largest organ that you have is your skin. And so uh, proper coverage of that should be in the form of some sort of uh, cannabinoid-based therapeutic, maybe a skin care line, let's say, or even something that you take uh, that you take orally for oral bioavailability. So this is, again goes to uh, consumer products, uh, improvement of, uh, of quality of life, and uh, trying to defend against what we've created in man-made uh, toxins and also uh, exposure to the sun. So, but the media is not covering any of that. But they are covering, they are covering areas that I think that really did everybody's heart, uh, the children. So in some sense of the word, you could say that they like the populist uh, perspective and they follow demagoguery. If there's some evil that's out there that uh, is attacking, they want to go after that evil. But they're really not focusing on the science. And I think it's something that uh, should be placed a lot of, there should be a lot of focus placed on it now at this point in time. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I just lost, I kind of lost the audio. I'm going to do sign language because I can't, I can't hear you. <laughs> I can't There, can you hear me now? I got you. <laughs> so, again, I was just very appreciative of your perspective and your willingness to communicate very directly on these issues. Uh, as a homeopath, I work with uh, these issues of chronic inflammation, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and uh, you know, as any healer should, I would say, in a high ideal, remain open to new thought forms, new ideas, new science that is being revealed. And sometimes it's going back in time to things that were used regularly and readily uh, in our culture in the West and also around the world. This plant has uh, thousands of years of recorded use, but we didn't have necessarily the scientific ability technologically to determine what were the pathways this plant and the substances would then it how is it helping to stimulate a regeneration of a system the nervous system that we were brought up in the western mindset supposedly we couldn't regenerate neural tissue as adult mammals I know that's not true but have you met with obstacles or, or, or a little bit of opposition on the whole concept of neurological regeneration? Well, you're bringing up a very important uh, topic right now, and that is the, uh, the issue of neurodege neurodegeneration and regeneration. And again, science has to really kick it into high gear at this point uh, so that there can be some very serious findings in these areas. Uh, clinical research is going to be paramount, which means you have to have the other side of it, which are the, the, the clinical practitioners that manage patients. Uh, it's like a personal trainer's relationship with somebody who goes to the gym. Uh, they, they monitor, they document, uh, they follow. Uh, so you, you need two sides of the equations to, to snap into place to really see what the long-term effects and benefits are going to be. Uh, neuroregeneration is, is theoretical at this point and you know we're working in a laboratory at Doylestown on a couple of areas and we're working in the area of brain liver disorder, hepatic encephalopathy which is neurodegenerative and we're doing work in chronic traumatic encephalopathy which is CTE which is the big buzzword now an acronym for NFL players that have retired and suffer from uh, brain disorders that have led to many suicides and uh, some violence and uh, some just crazy stuff, the outbreak of which comes from uh, a damaged brain. Now, uh, regeneration will be a big part of this. Uh, so the follow-on research that we're doing hopefully will lead us to make some certain conclusions. But in the long term, it has to regard patient use, patient monitoring, uh, clinical response, and clinical record keeping, which is something else that we do at Catalog. We set up a database to do just that and look at a monograph of cannabinoids, not just the, the top five or the, or the top three, but uh, there's a, a pantheon of chemicals that are in the plant that any one of which could probably have some synergistic effect and, and adaptogenic effect in the body. Again, it goes back to how do you find out about patient use, patient follow-through, uh, test results, MRIs, PET, PET scans, CAT scans, 
and the before and after uh, uh, with regards to the use of cannabinoid therapeutics. Beautiful. I want to ask you as well, you mentioned uh, hepatic encephalopathy. I think it is what I heard. Uh, we're talking about liver health, and in my practice, it's only about that. A primary focus, liver health, liver detoxification, supporting the drainage and the detoxification of the body, because if you don't, if you don't do that adequately, any system of the body can be corrupted by the toxic burden, inflammatory burden, oxidative stress. So as far as your patent, if it relates to this or not, I'm not certain, but relate to me what you're seeing as far as the CBD influence or impact on liver function, liver cell, liver detoxification? I, I really can't talk about it at the moment because of the propriety of something that we filed in the form of a patent. But what I can tell you is that CBD is indeed a neuroprotectant, that there is a log of efficiency with CBD in a control with regards to ethanol and ammonia toxicity. We believe that there is something in hepatocyte uh, activity that could lead to repairing liver function. We can't make that conclusion yet. Uh, we are hopeful that the early work that's being done continues to point in that direction. Uh, as you well know, Robert, that the uh, concentration of endocannabinoids in the human body are dispersed. You have them in the brain, uh, but the most predominant of which are found in terms of quantity are in the liver. So I think we picked a, a, a pretty good disease indication of which to make some determinations as to the potency and power of uh, CBD in brain and liver function. Well, you can't fault me for trying to get you to reveal more about the <laughs> liver, and I'm excited about that aspect of it almost as much or perhaps more than almost any other because I know how it relates to every aspect of even these neurodegenerative scenarios or situations. Uh, and, you know, we, we get into another area of pain and pain research related to the nerves and more. Uh, yeah. I will share with you my personal experience. I did this on stage, and I'll continue to talk about it on my radio broadcast. My wife suffered for two plus years with a, a, a neuralgia, a, a, an incredible pain, a trigeminal neuralgia. And she had been utilizing everything we had in our arsenal holistically, herbally, homeopathically, uh, from essential fatty acids as well, with minimal success, even resorted, much against our belief system, to uh, pharmacological agents in the narcotic realm. And none of that even touched the pain, really did anything but knocked her out in a way that she couldn't function. And then when we came across the CBD, we were able to utilize it, uh, you know, based on the uh, recommendation of another healthcare provider. Uh, in her situation, and for the first time in two plus years, she was able to become pain free and functional again. That tells me that what this is, is a, a gift from a far higher place, and even science can validate, although we're all about validating with science, and that's what you do. But to hear stories like this and have it now personally happen in my family, I recognize that there are pathways that are well beyond just simple activation or deactivation or regeneration of, of, of healthy nerve function. And, and when you recognize and are studying more about the, the role of its impact on the liver, I see that the, uh, there's an unlimited array of possibilities for this plant. And I don't mean to exaggerate, but I really am excited about this and the fact that you're investing in the science. I can't, I can't say enough thank you you to do that. So uh, anything that you feel free safely to comment on about what I've related, I'd love to hear more from you on that pain issue. Well, there, there are a couple of things that we could talk about anecdotally and I'll share with you in, in a moment, but uh, to speak to what you just said, uh, there's an old axiom that was uh, supposedly quoted by Ronald Reagan, but was really a, a garbage child quote, is a trust but verify. When a God plant only asks you to trust. Uh, verification comes from watching others who have seen and, and have uh, gotten the relief that was necessary by actually consuming uh, and, and utilizing cannabis or hemp related products that have these pharmacological uh, compounds in them. Uh, so we talk about roots of administration also, uh, what are more effective. I was curious to see what route of administration that your wife took with regards to the neuropathy she had over here in, in, in her mouth. She, she was utilizing the RSHO uh, oil, uh, literally local application at the gum line, holding it there present for prolonged periods. And she recently switched to a form that was encapsulated. And within about three days, four days, she was starting to see that it would sustain the impact. But initially, she needed a lot of local, super concentrated form. Uh, and now, as I said, she's transitioning a little bit. I haven't been home for a few days to find out, but she 
she called me only four days into it because she said at day two I felt like there was something really wonderful happening, but I didn't want to get your hopes up, honey. Right? Because you know we've been at this for a long time. And so when she did finally tell me, she said, yes, it's indeed doing it. Because by the end of the day, when she said, an active day with the kids and taking care and running around, normally she would be back into a painful state. But she wasn't having that happen. And so uh, she was ecstatic. I'm ecstatic. And I, if, if I'm gushing with gratitude, it's because you, you, if, you, if you could imagine having a spouse or yourself being into that kind of pain and finding a plant that is non-toxic, that can bring about this level of relief and perhaps even healing, uh, you can you can imagine how excited I am to communicate this with the world. Sure, absolutely. I uh, share a story with you recently, where uh, we had access to a semi-purified compound. Uh, it was a cannabis extract, and uh, my uh, friend's son, who's 20 years old, had a, a real massive infection right in here, and uh, they didn't know what to do. It was the holiday weekend; we couldn't get him to a doctor, or dentist. We come home from West Virginia, and I just uh, went into the uh, the medicine cabinet. Uh, I I drew about uh, maybe a half an mL of product for him, and he used it and localized it. Uh, it was probably a two to one ratio of uh, CBD to THC and other plant matter that was in there, and uh, he got uh, the rest of the value that he needed. But uh, it subsided the infection, so by the time he went to the dentist to take care of the additional problems that he had with the uh, molar incisor and stuff like that that would needed to be extracted, uh, they were able to do the work that they needed to do, and, and uh, thankfully the infection didn't travel. This is a really uh, funky area that uh, can lead to some very serious problems because you're already above the blood-brain barrier, so you get an infection in your mouth that could travel to your brain very, very quickly. Uh, so that may be another area that science should start to practice in localization uh, cannabinoid therapeutics uh, uses even anti-inflammatory agents to repress and suppress uh, the, the, the possibility of potential of an infection travel. Uh, now, going back from the intensity of the um, pain issue, like with my wife and others that I'm hearing, again, positive, very positive results, we step back to a nutritional perspective or nutritional understanding. I, I talk about the neglecting of a system that is inherent to us all, this endocannabinoid system, by the abolishment or making illegal a plant that uh, you know, is of creation and, and should be used appropriately for all of us. Uh, can you verify, for instance, the presence of something like CBD in breast milk or any other food, certainly, uh, that would make, uh, uh, let's say, a normal acceptance to this? Not, it wouldn't be unusual. It would be like, well, why weren't we using this? Because the, the body needs this. It's it's one of the first things we would get from mom, for instance. Uh, I can't uh, uh, reply. Uh, I probably have to get with our team in Doylestown. What I can't tell you is that Doug Friedman does a lot of biological work for us uh, and uh, he's a senior distinguished, senior distinguished scientist uh, with Canalog. We do a lot of research together. Uh, had done a 10-year study of F-tox in utero. And, uh, you know, we know what the the, I guess the daisy chain is between a fetus and the mother and the feeding of the fetus in, in, in utero. Uh, so I don't know if uh, post-birth that there's passage in mother's milk. Of uh, I'm sure there, there are body nutrients that are passed through uh, continuously in, in breastfeeding. Uh, it, and you know, what those nutrients are, I think, are something that to, to the science of uh, pediatricians and uh, you know, and, and doctors of life, you know, we can't speak to it right now. What we can speak to is what we do know in utero. So, for instance, uh, we know that there's ethanol toxicity in utero that leads to behavioral problems with children uh, over a 10-year study from, from birth to 10 years, and that's work that Doug had done. So, for instance, if a mother has a tendency of being an alcoholic, a single mother, they, they tend to... Uh, We've seen studies, inner city studies of behavioral problems in children, and the possibility is that either alcohol or drug abuse can lead to uh, the, the child's need based on neuronal activity, early neuronal activity, of those substances, of the hydroxyls and alcohol. The, the brain cells look to differentiate right away. So if the mother had something in the form of a product that she was taking that could help offset 
the the alcohol that becomes an alcohol dependency in a child, that would be a good thing. Uh, we're also looking at the potential use of CBD as a nutritional supplement for mothers during the birthing period. Uh, again, it's not just in utero what the, the mothers take in the form of, uh, of, of a toxin like an alcohol, but it also could be dietary, you know, feeding in the system radicals because of our diet is, uh, in, in America, it's just an absolutely horrendous diet. Uh, so what are we doing, you know, in, in the birthing of a child to protect the child uh, and protect, you know, brain activity and all activity and cell growth? So these are things that, you know, you're talking about, we talked about the 24-hour conversation. We can get into that. Uh, and we could talk endlessly to Okay. So uh, let's see. What other questions might we have? Super Don, of course, you've been involved as my producer as we've uncovered a lot of this on the air and, and the, the research we've been doing behind the scenes. We were able to, to meet Dean in person at, the, at an event in Denver. Uh, hopefully, we'll see Dean in Atlanta. I don't know if that, are you going to Atlanta, Dean? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Okay. We'll see him to Atlanta. Yes. So, big event coming up, and we'll be there broadcasting and interviewing, and hopefully speaking briefly about this and the role of the media in bringing this message out because it is like a wildfire. We are uh, seeing a, a genuine uh, high degree of interest here at Autism One for a lot of these children, as I said, that have been damaged for various reasons, whether it be medically or just in a general environmental sense. Looking to to see what other botanical substances can be utilized, and uh, uh, Dean uh, Pacanis is here with Candle Life Sciences to uh, reveal what he can in part in terms of the patent of the science and the science that they're doing, and the discoveries that have yet to be made, as we kind of asked him about some liver stuff, and he confirmed that there is more ongoing investigation in that realm. Are there any other systems or specific organs that have been uh, looked at or are being looked at because of anecdotal reports that you know warrant more investigation? Uh, central and peripheral nervous system activity. Uh, we've also found in uh, preclinical studies that there's pretty good uh, uh, central nervous system spinal fluid activity with CBD, which means the transport mechanics are there. Uh, distribution is fairly good. Bioavailability is good. Oral capsulation versus IV. And so that means that uh, the, the distribution throughout the body reaching the endocannabinoid system and other parts of the body is fairly efficient. When you look at uh, peripheral nervous system activity, you're talking about the enteric system. Uh, probably, I would guess that there may be some good use in kidney function. Uh, there probably could be some good use as a prophylaxis. It's the onset of pancreatic uh, uh, abnormalities. I'm not going to speak to cancer, but uh, I do know that there's a good potential there in regards to pancreatic cancer. Uh, I've heard stories, and not just one, but already dozens of stories of how uh, cannabis extracts have been utilized very effectively in the treatment of pancreatic cancer. Uh, we also know that uh, uh, cannabis has a, uh, a, a cycle approach uh, in areas where prostaglandin uh, is intermediated, and there could be some effective use not only in thrombocytopenias, which are basically leg swelling uh, of your your veins being constricted, not getting proper blood flow uh, to the lower extremities of the body, and of course prostate cancer. So there's so many other areas, but getting back to autism because you're focusing your, your efforts today on autism one, the patent, the 507 patent, talked about the potential use of cannabinoids to intermediate Down syndrome. Now, uh, that's a really interesting, uh, that's a, a, a really interesting use of uh, cannabinoid therapeutics, and it was a long ball that we thought that uh, would just take uh, a lot of time, effort, money uh, to get into. But we know that uh, we think that, that Down syndrome is a, a genetic related uh, issue where chromosomes are, are, are not paired properly. Uh, if there's an effect of improving quality of life for Down syndrome children, then there, there probably would be an effect in other neurodegenerative uh, base pair chromosomal diseases that are out there, including autism potentially, uh, and certainly also Alzheimer's. We're looking at neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. So I hope that kind of answers to the question with regards to the pantheon of potential uh, that, that exists for cannabinoid-based therapeutics in 
treatment of a variety of different diseases and disorders. Yes, very comprehensive. Now, Dean, I, I focus a lot on gastrointestinal health. I, I develop protocols homeopathically with utilizing other substances to heal epithelial tissue at a rapid rate. And after interviewing many families and doctors that have seen improvement in the health and vitality of children that are in, diagnosed into the autism spectrum, uh, I see without fail these children have horrible gastrointestinal function. And a lot of this is due to chronic inflammatory bowel diseases, iatrogenic enterocolitis as it's called, and I have to imagine that there is a profound impact on epithelial tissue and healing of that tissue based on what I'm seeing and hearing about rapid recovery. Can you go into any more detail on epithelial interaction, whether it be topical on the skin or whether it be internal to the GI tract? I couldn't speak to it just at the moment. Uh, you know, as we expand our, our portfolio of research and we start taking our target drug candidate, uh, we are going to test it across the board because of the, the way that the, the, the target drug candidate has uh, performed even side by side with CBD, which we have a CBD light compound uh, and we're working with CBD and uh, we're going to continue to, to move that across a variety of different disorders, uh, one of which we're now looking at is anti, uh, as a, um, uh, an anti-seizure uh, medicament. We'll, we'll start to work in skin care where we may use our compound uh, in a skincare monograph with an FDA, uh, you know, with a slant towards dealing with uh, dermatoses, keratinocytosis, and stuff that uh, we would need to see a positive response in, uh, in, in cell function, the skin level, uh, the dermis. So going back to the digestive cell wall, uh, we think that they could, we could double that over. Uh, but if we were to do the research, I think it would probably be within the next 18 months as we're kind of completing the first round, the first run to the brain liver side. All right. I almost got to extract the molar from Dean on that one. Excellent, <laughs> excellently <laughs> answered. Appreciate that. Uh, also, uh, the use in anxiety. You know, the, 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 ter the, the terminal disease is stress for everybody. In the West, particularly, uh, what we have seen in a dietary intake not even in a high level intake, but a dietary intake, an improvement of stress response, a reduction in uh, uh, the things that normally would uh, bother folks. I'll tell you another personal anecdote. Uh, last couple of weeks have been incredibly stressful for me with the broadcast, with traveling, and uh, I, I was going to do another remote uh, this past weekend, and it was really kind of a crazy thing to do, talking with my wife about it. You, what, why would you consider going out of town before you have to go out of town again the next day? And I said, but honey, I actually, I feel great. I feel absolutely great. And we, she looked at me and said, well, what have you been doing different? Well, I've been taking CBD, CBD. every day. <laughs> and I, I have to say that that anxiousness that would normally occur with a high level of stress was greatly reduced to the point where I was functioning in a, spa in a space or a place. Well, and there was like very, there were a few technical issues and things that normally would have been like, oh, yeah, like that. And he was just like. Oh, that's very right. we'll get it figured out. Yeah. So again, I, I, I leave it to you to take us back into the scientific realm as to how or what you can say about that. But I have to say, it's just a very profound impact when you know a certain uh, response in your body should take place to an extreme where you wouldn't want to go, and you're now in integrating and, and nourishing the endocannabinoid. That's a reaction, and you can function through it. That alone is a gift <laughs> from the heavens. Uh, the, the research science, it's not just ours, uh, but others focused on uh, where the inflammatory cycle begins. The stress, uh, as we know, begins in your adipocytes, right in here, in your fatty tissue, and uh, it works its way out. It's kind of funny, it's a vicious cycle. Uh, stress makes you gain weight, uh, so you're kind of like feeding the cycle of stress, making sure that your adipocytes can continue to scream out. Uh, so that uh, stress remains in this vicious cycle. Well, CBD would probably, uh, when, once it's scientifically proven to do so, uh, prove that it quiets down uh, the, the activity uh, that creates this cortisol and stress cycle that causes you to gain weight. Uh, some of the anecdotal evidence has been proven to show how the balance of cannabinoids work. So let's take a talk about pain and then we'll talk about weight.
when we're talking about consumption. Uh, CBD intermediates uh, what uh, the psychotropic effects of THC. That's well known and regarded. It's now even being brought into the body of science very efficiently. So, for instance, if you have a one to one or two to one ratio of CBD to THC, you can see the effects of the psychotropic values when somebody's taking a THC uh, of a dominant strain or medicament to deal with pain or to interrupt the allodynia cycle. So, the, a body of CBD kind of overwhelms the high from THC. We also know that THC has been an appetite, uh, improves appetite function for people who are suffering from cancer, chemotherapy that need to deal with intractable pain and appetite and nausea from the chemotherapy. Yet CBD that interacts with the pain and the psychotropic high from using THC has also been known to be an appetite suppressant. So getting back to this idea of, of suppressing adipose tissue activity or the screaming out effect that you call in chronic inflammation, the probability is high that CBD quiets down that uh, inflammatory cycle that starts in here. And this is where most of your All right, should we should, can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. Hey. So I was saying why did it mute again? I don't get ah, so we're wrestling with somebody else here. Okay. We're trying to unmute. We're unmute. unmuting locally. Yeah, okay, okay, now we're back. Don't touch it. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we don't want our stress levels to go up beyond the levels of, of which CBD is capable of helping us. Uh, uh, Super Don and I have got a broadcast live the Robert Scott Bell Show as we do six days a week for two hours a day. And we're about to get ready for that. Uh, I will say, uh, Dean, that we look forward to seeing you in Atlanta at the Canaway event uh, coming up this Saturday. We will be here in Chicago at the Intercontinental Hotel, of course, today being Thursday, Friday, and then again on Sunday for another live broadcast. And we're interacting today uh, with a number of doctors and scientists, including uh, our good friend, uh, Dr. John Hicks, pediatrician. He's been working with the CBD in practice. So we're looking forward to that, to that. So you can check that out at robertscottbell.com. Dean, before we have to sign off to go live on the air for the show, the radio show, uh, any uh, like periods on the end of the sentence? I think you, you did incredibly well in, in relating so much in a short period of time. My pleasure. I'm glad to have the opportunity to be here with you guys. Look forward to seeing you in Atlanta. Awesome. So everybody, if you're in the Atlanta area, come on down. Uh, it'll be at the Sheraton downtown Atlanta on Saturday, all day, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. 9 a.m., 9 p.m. We're flying. We're commuting in from Chicago just for the day to be there with you guys, and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody. And uh, as far as the radio broadcast, we'll keep covering these stories and talking to doctors out here at the Autism One event and also inviting everybody back when we're together at the uh, Chicago Cannabis Conference, I believe it's called, and that's on the Navy Pier. June is 7th and 8th. I want to say thanks to all the folks that are supporting us to be there, including My Compassion, a great group at mycompassion.org, and they're providing some things for people that really desperately need it. And uh, good heart, and it's good for the kind of things that I like to do for people, bringing the power to heal back to them. And you're doing that as well, Dean. We appreciate and respect you very much. Keep up the good work. Let's keep the doctors. Let's get people healed. Absolutely. So thanks for being here. We're going to sign off now. Come on down in 15 or so minutes. We'll be back on live on the Robert Scott Bell Show through naturalnewsradio.com and our syndicator GCN, then heard broadcast around the world at UK Health Radio and Digital Radio-103 down under in Australia. This is a message that has global ramifications and implications, not in a negative context, but in a way that empowers you to do the things that I believe you're designed to do by that which created us all. And so I'll sign off with the catchphrase of the Robert Scott Bell Show, and you know it, the power to heal is yours.